Jonathan Kirshner, welcome to Hidden Forces. Thank you for having me. It's my pleasure having you on, Jonathan. I was just telling you before we turned on the microphone how much I really enjoyed not just discovering your work because I was not familiar with it, which is surprising, uh, but also reading your latest book. It's phenomenal. We're going to get into it and the subject it covers and applying it to both historical cases and then also forward to the world we live in today. But before we do any of that, I would love if you could give me and our listeners a sense of who you are, your background, how you got into the field of international relations. Sure. Um, well, I'm a professor of international relations. I currently teach at Boston College after many years at Cornell University. I got into international relations strangely because it interested me as a relatively young person. And so it has been part of my intellectual trajectory since uh, my college days. I sort of went back and forth between economics and international politics uh, in both undergraduate and my graduate work, but ended up gravitating toward international relations. And I've been doing that ever since. And my work usually is in either international relations theory or what they call in my business, international political economy, the politics of economic relations. And as a sidebar, I also do a lot of work in the politics of film. Yes, you've written a book on 1970s film culture, which I just, I wished that I had the time to read that book. As you know, I kind of was reading furiously to complete not just your latest book, but also parts of uh, two of your previous works. But I, I that I love that. And, you know, listeners will know that we've done an episode on, uh, well, we've done many episodes on culture that are relevant and intersect with the episodes we've done on IR and geopolitics and the economy. But uh, two in particular, one very recent one in the 1990s, pop mm -hmm. culture of the 1990s with Chuck Klosterman, and one we did in the very early days on television history and culture because of the important role that television and film plays in myth-making and in the process of telling us who we are and in helping us uh, uh, work through our past and tell ourselves stories about our future. You know, it's a, it's a really powerful device. I also love what you talk, what, how you use the term political economy. You talked about this in the book as well. Also a very important term that I think works well or sit, is situated well with the uh, framing of classical realism because it very, very much... What we think of today as economics was, in the early days, really political economy. Yes. And a lot of the early economists understood that the two were so intertwined. Um, you, As I mentioned, you're a, you're a realist, or I kind of alluded to it when I talked about classical realism. What turned you into a realist? I'm curious. Were you always, and we'll get into what that is. Listeners know we've had, for example, John Mearsheimer and Stephen Walt, both realists on the, on the podcast before. But uh, what turned you into a realist? Well, first of all, I want to emphasize that realism comes in many, many stripes. So to say someone is a realist doesn't really narrowly define them in one particular way. Um, and it is not a theory, but it's simply a way in which you view the world. So you look at the, wor at the window, and what does the world look like to you? Why am I a realist? Uh, I don't know. I guess there are two reasons, one intellectual and one slightly amusing. The intellectual one is, I assume that my vast reading as a student uh, in international politics, I found myself gravitating toward certain types of works, and those works are, were commonly affiliated uh, with the realist school of thought. And so perhaps I, I saw myself in sympathy with them. The other is that uh, I grew up in New York City in the late 70s and early 80s, and that was a rather anarchic time, uh, a time that I think looked a lot like what realists would think the real world looked like. And so maybe that was a formative influence as well. But that's that's a bit of a lighthearted interpretation as to why I may have become a realist. I do think it was in discovering the intellectual contributions of a number of scholars who seemed to me to do a very good job at describing, explaining, and helping me understand how the world works. So what are the basic tenets of realism? Let's get into those before we kind of break down how that differs from the classical school which you identify yourself with? Sure. Um, all realists take, I think, as a point of departure the presence of international anarchy. Now, non-realists also see anarchy out there, and anarchy simply means there's no single authority to adjudicate disputes. So it's a self-help system. And again, that's not a realist disposition. That's a disposition that many international relations theorists hold. But I do think that it is 
common for realists to emphasize the consequences of anarchy. And those consequences, I think, are twofold. One is that there simply is no assurances that the behaviors of others will be restrained. And therefore, you have to be alert to the dangers, present and latent, that may occur in the international system, and therefore prepare yourself for those possibilities. So it's that kind of wariness and caution, and also the concerns about really how horrifying human behavior can be, uh, that civilizational order can be thin and disrupted. So I think that was, that's an important part of realism. Another important part of realism that I think distinguishes it from other schools of thought is that it doesn't see disputes in international politics as necessarily misunderstandings, but rather simply the clash of contrasting interests. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that. Actors often have different interests. And so the politics is, a, is about those clash of interests. So now you add anarchy into that, and then you're in a world in which states and other actors can use violence in order to advance those interests. It doesn't mean they always will, uh, but it means they might. And so you need to be alert to that. And finally, I think I would add a, what is one of the things that I find distinct about realism is that politics never ends. So it's not really about problem solving. If there's a dispute uh, and that dispute is resolved, either peaceably or forcibly, there will be new disputes over the horizon, and they will come forward. And so you also have to engage in international politics with an alertness to the fact that after you take care of the problem you have today, there will be new problems tomorrow. And so the way in which you address today's problems, you need to have one eye on the fact that there will be new problems looming on the horizon. I guess the classic example of that would be that Two years after the epical uh, World War II, which seemed to settle everything, mm -hmm. and then two years later, there's suddenly a new big international problem of uh, the Cold War. And so the idea is that when that is resolved, there'll be new sets of contestations that emerge. So the phrase I use in the book is that there is no end zone in world politics. So I think those are probably the principal contours of what a realist perspective starts with. And that also means that realists tend to be very alert to the relative capabilities of other actors in the international system, since it's an anarchic and potentially dangerous world, not necessarily dangerous world, but potentially dangerous world. You need to keep an eye on the capabilities of others. And a, a loose term for that is often the balance of power. Who has the ability to do what in international politics? So the system is the international system is anarchic, but it's also but the distribution of power, the balance of power within the system is also dynamic. And and we assume a sort of infinite progression so that there is, as there, as you said, no end game. How do we think about anarchy in the context of unipolarity? So in the 1990s and in the early 2000s, we lived in what we call generally a unipolar world. What is that? How do you think about anarchy in that context? So that was a challenge, that is unipolarity, uh, for many of our traditional theories of international politics, uh, because most of those theories tend to look at the balance of power and what they found analytically useful from a balance of power was that the abilities of other states would shape and constrain what what each state in the system could do. And so unipolarity was an extraordinarily permissive moment in that the greatest power in the system, then the United States for a period of time, was oddly unconstrained by the traditional concerns of the balance of power. Now, there were still concerns for the balance of power, but it was a situation that was extraordinarily atypical. And so if you think of all of the countries in the world is creating implicitly an international system. Many theories of international politics argue that those systemic forces constrain all of the actors in the system. But when you have one power that is extraordinarily more powerful than the others, um, then that systemic constraint is less imposing. And so it becomes very difficult to use external theories to try and explain the behavior of that sole superpower or, or unipole. 
I want to let listeners know that there's actually a, a methodology to how I'm approaching today's episode. I mean, there's always a kind of an outline, but I'm trying my best to kind of structure this because what I want to spend the initial part of the episode doing is really working on the theory and then applying that theory to historical cases and then applying it to the world we live in today. You write in the book that, quote, this book seeks to reclaim realism and rearticulate classical realism as a worthwhile and even vital point of departure for the study of world politics. I'm familiar with how what we call, you know, physics envy, mm-hmm. the uh, borrowing of or the, um, yeah, the borrowing of models and frameworks from the natural and physical sciences and their application in the in the domain of social science uh, proliferated in the field of economics post World War II as part of this effort to structure and order the world and and to find deterministic solutions for social systems. In the field of economics, there's been a reversal, uh, at least at the um, at the practitioner edge mm-hmm. since the 2008 financial crisis. I was not aware that there was that there has been some similar type of reversal. But I don't know that it's been as profound, uh, pervasive, or that it began in 2008 in the field of international relations. What has been the legacy of this quest for deter- deterministic certainty and for models that are that that uh, replicate something that we've seen in the physical sciences in the field of IR beyond game theory, which I'm familiar with, you know, John von Neumann and John Nash. What has been the legacy there and when and why did we begin to move away from that? So that raises several questions and I want to unpack them uh, because they're each very important. Uh, you're, you started with one of the agendas of the book, which is to so-called reclaim realism. And that is, I think, the principal product of the book to reclaim realism. And that begs the question of reclaim it from what? And so there are two principal intellectual adversaries in the book. And one is within the realist community, something called structural realism, uh, which is so predominant within the realist community still that many people conflate realism with structural realism, whereas my claim is you can be a realist without being a structural realist. And we've kind of touched on structural realism already by talking about how the that international system can impose pressures on states that nudges them to behave in one direction or the other. And so I wanted to say, actually, there's a richer tradition of realism that is sensitive to structural pressures, but includes a lot more than that. And then the other intellectual adversary are the hyper-rationalists, a community that has embraced, as you noted, a very narrow form of economistic theory, in particular, rational expectations theory, one of the theories that, by the way, brought us the global financial crisis. Mm. Um, And there's a very influential school of thought within international relations built around a bargaining model, as they call it, that embraces rational expectations theory. That can also be seen as sort of realist, although not necessarily so. But those are the two principal intellectual adversaries uh, of of classical realism, which I'm trying to reintroduce, not so that everybody should be a classical realist. That would be not a good thing either. But rather just to say we have this other paradigm or sub-paradigm that has been sort of let go, forgotten, or in the minds of its adversaries, superseded. And I think it actually has a lot of value to add. So that's the first part of what what you introduced in that question. The second part of what you introduced is also extremely important. The other part of what you asked, uh, what what you raised in, in your query had to do with... Um, well, no, 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 with um, the distinction between the natural sciences and the social sciences. And what we saw with the development of the two schools of thought I was talking about, structural realism and hyper-rationalism, is an embrace of a certain type of scientism, of physics envy, um, that looked at, that conflated studies of the natural world and the social world. And I think one of the fundamental contributions that classical realism has to make to the study of international politics is its insistence on this red line distinction between the social world and the natural world. So that approaches that try and model 
on the natural world, a sort of social Newtonian physics. Hmm. Uh, cl from a classical realist perspective, those will be doomed to fail because the social world is fundamentally different from the natural world. And so you do not want to use the same styles of analysis to understand each. Yeah, I mean, I absolutely love this. And it's been an obsession of mine and an interest of mine since the very earliest days of the podcast. I mean, obviously before the podcast, but I made a deliberate point to explore this uh, in the early days. And there are so many episodes that I could think of. The one that immediately popped to mind was with the founder of the high energy physics group at Los Alamos, Jeffrey West, who had written a, a book at the time titled Scale. And he looked at the difference between physical and socioeconomic systems. But I think one of the fundamental distinctions is that in socio in social systems, the ideas of the actors within the system, their interests, their desires, their ambitions, their actions influence the system itself, which is why it's non-deterministic. And I so I I feel like you know, this is one of the reasons why I found your book so interesting and why I'm so excited to actually apply this framework to some of these historical examples. So maybe maybe that's a good way to kind of get into some of the other assumptions of classical realism by kind of applying it to some of the cases that you raised in the book. And of course, one of the sexiest, most exciting um, cases, because who doesn't love ancient history, is the case of uh, Sparta and Athens in the Peloponnesian War which is one of those things that kind of everyone has in their grab bag. Everyone loves to pull from, you know, that case and apply to it many different types of lessons, some some of which are, I think, maybe the wrong lessons, and we can get into what your thoughts are on that. But how would a classical realist look at the case of the Peloponnesian War, and what can we learn about that war and how it relates to um, the world that we live in today? And also, think, please tell our listeners who aren't familiar with with that with the Peloponnesian War what it was, its duration, the actors, and you know its historical relevance. Sure, the Peloponnesian War, which took place about twenty five hundred years ago, was a twenty seven year conflict between two predominant city states, uh, Athens and Sparta. Although there were other important actors involved, and we know a lot about that war because a historian, although he didn't really call himself that because they didn't have academic disciplines back then, called Thucydides, um, who was an Athenian general who was exiled because of a failure in his generalship during the war, gave him the opportunity to study the war closely. And he made a tremendous effort to try and leave what he called something for all time, a, a description of the war that would implicitly provide lessons about what we today would call domestic and international politics. And he produced this remarkable book uh, uh, about the history of the Peloponnesian War, which, as I said, was a 27-year conflict that really took place in three phases, a, a period of about 10 years of fighting and then a seven-year interregnum and then another 10 years of fighting. And what is remarkable about this book is it is astonishing in its political insights. And this is remarkable because it did happen you know, millennia ago, it was a war that took place between, you know, city states on the cusp of the Mediterranean using, you know, what we would consider extraordinarily primitive weapons uh, in societies and settings that are quite different from ours. And yet many people, uh, there's a quite a large industry of academics who study Thucydides for one reason or another, pour over the text of this book. Most of them, most of the classicists do it in ancient Greek. I, I rely on English language translations. Uh, and they study and discuss this. For classical realists, I think what is most important about the book is not what it tells us about the conflict, but what it tells us about what Thucydides had to say about the nature of politics so that we can derive t many, many timeless lessons from this ancient conflict that he provided for us. So it's packaged as a straight history. And I do think it's fair to say that Thucydides went to enormous lengths to tell this history as accurately as, as he possibly could and as objectively as he possibly could, although surely he made mistakes and surely he had a distinct point of view. Nevertheless, in telling that story, the way in which he told the story 
contained all of these observations about, again, what we call today international politics that I think still remain true and of value. Now, in my book, An Unwritten Future, which tries to derive the tenets of classical realism, I talk a lot about Thucydides in the early going and other classical realists, not to genuflect before them, not to say these guys were perfect and knew everything, but rather to say it's kind of interesting that all of these thinkers looked at the world in a certain way, and we can distill certain common themes from all of their writings and say, We take them collectively, and this is one way of understanding how the world works. And so that's why Thucydides is so interesting, because it's really the the point of departure for many people who are interested in realism and classical realism. So in your book, you talk quite a bit about the additional assumptions that classical realists make or some of the different assumptions that classical realists make. And one of those is the emphasis of on, on, on uncertainty, which is kind of not really an assumption. It's more like making away with certain assumptions, recognizing that fundamentally we live in an uncertain universe and that many of the events that define the, the future, the stories that we tell about the past were unknow- not just unknowable, but were truly unknown and unexpected to the actors who experienced them. A classic example in the Peloponnesian War is the plague, which t- took the life of Pericles, who was its great leader in the third year of the war. And so um, let's let's actually use this example to talk about uncertainty, because uh, because what I what I think we can try and do is begin to pick apart some of these core assumptions. Some of the other ones that we're going to talk about is context, that history matters, that the system is inductive, not deductive. Back to the point about social versus physical systems and um, and the importance of humility and prudence and that ideology matters, ideas matter, leadership matters. It's not the system, again, is not simply about states acting deterministically, and it's simply everyone's going to do what's in what's in the interest of security and securing their borders, and that's what's going to drive everything. So let's talk about uncertainty. Where does uncertainty fit into all of this, and what can we see in the case of the Peloponnesian War that exemplifies it? Yes, let's talk about uncertainty because it is indeed very much at the heart of this and it's very much at the heart of classical realism. The subtitle of the book is Realism and Uncertainty in World Politics for a Reason. And it gets back to the point I was making about the distinction between the social and the natural world and how you study them. In regular people talking amongst themselves, you often use risk and uncertainty as ter- as terms meaning the same thing. But as a technical matter, risk and uncertainty are profoundly different concepts. Risk is when we know the underlying actuarial probabilities of an outcome. So if I roll two dice, I cannot predict the outcome that's going to occur when the dice are rolled. But I can tell you with precision the exact odds of every possible outcome. So the underlying actual actuarial risk of rolling the dice is known. That's why insurance companies can make money, because they can understand the underlying actuarial risk of the- The underlying the, statistical structure of the data set. Exactly. But in a world of uncertainty, we do not have access to that underlying actuarial data. We, the, the, the right phrase to use here is, we simply do not know. To <laughs> invoke the title of the book, the future is unwritten. We have no theories on which we can deploy to know with probabilistic certainty what's going to happen next. And if you're living in a world of uncertainty, you must look at the world differently than if you're living in a world of risk. And one of the things that distinguishes classical realists from non-classical realists, and certainly from the hyper-rationalists, is the view that the world we're living in is a world of uncertainty uh, and not a world of risk. Rational expectations theory and the bargaining model of war, for example, all require known actuarial risk, and they cannot function in a world of uncertainty, or perhaps redundantly, what we could call radical uncertainty, where we simply do not share the same correct underlying model of how the world or how the economy or how international politics works. If there are competing analytical models of how the world works, then two rational actors can look at exactly the same information 
and come to very distinct expectations about, quote unquote, what will happen next. And that is a world of uncertainty, and that is a much more complicated world than a world of risk. Thucydides thought he was living in a world of uncertainty, and so he was not a deterministic thinker, and the, his account of the Peloponnesian War is peppered with illustrations where unexpected events, unanticipated events, unanticipatable events had profound consequences on what happened next. And so even when he's calling attention to things that he views as terrible blunders, even there he leaves the door open for although it could have happened differently. So he says this was, he suggests this move was a terrible idea, but nevertheless, even then, he still leaves space for the notion that surely anything could have happened. We can just look at this and say, well, I assess that was a really bad thing to do. Uh, and he had some very strong feelings about about that sort of thing. You know, um, now this was the Hellenic, period but in you know, the bronze age produced many myths speaking to the um to the importance of humility uh through stories of kings and others who really got high on their raisin as they say in the south and uh and so the interesting about the, the, this particular story the peloponnesian war is that it show you see from the very beginning and different people draw different lessons from it but you see that it's not clear when you begin a conflict, when you enter into a, into a war, um, what necessarily qualifies as prudence and what perhaps is paralysis, you know, becoming overly prudent. So some people will look at the Peloponnesian War and say it was imprudent for Pericles to um, push for the war's initiation against Sparta to become a regional hegemon. But I think someone like Peric someone like uh, Thucydides might actually have I think he was actually okay with the with that. I think I, I haven't read the the text. I've only read, you know, other people's accounts of it. But it seems like his major um indictment was the Sicilian expedition, the decision to try and really take on too much, to go for more, so mm -hmm. to speak. Um, what can we learn about how how do we think about prudence and political judgment. What does that tell us about this? And that's also going to open up a, a conversation about the Iraq war for the United States and the case of um, Ukraine and Russia's invasion of Ukraine, because I also want to highlight something else just for food for thought about um, rationalism. You know, when Putin invaded Ukraine, a lot of commentators were saying he's irrational. But in point of fact, he probably is very rational. It's just that his reasons are different than our reasons, and we can't necessarily understand them. So, to bring it all the way back, what does what can we what can we gleam about prudence and the importance of leadership and decision making from the Peloponnesian War, and then let's apply that to the case of Iraq and Ukraine. So, once again, you've raised three really central and important points here, and once again, I'm going to try and unpack them one at a time because they're each so analytically important and so much at the center of the project of classical realism that I, I want to walk through them slowly. Because the first observation you made uh, was, what lessons did Thucydides want us to draw from the Peloponnesian War? Because we often hear bandied about phrases like a Thucydides trap. And this refers to something that is said early on in Thucydides' account about how the war was was caused by Sparta's fear of a rising Athens. And so somehow the trap is that Athens and Sparta sort of sleptwalked into a conflict that neither wanted. Um, and as you just suggested correctly, uh, that's not Thucydides' perspective. Uh, Thucydides' perspective was that he, he was actually in favor of the initial war. As, as you intimated, Pericles was a bit of a warmonger when it came to the start of, of the Peloponnesian War. He was strongly in favor of it, and he rallied the, the, the city in favor of the conflict. And Thucydides very much appears to implicitly endorse Pericles' position. And in fact, Athens does pretty well uh, during that first phase of the, of the Peloponnesian War. Thus, there is a Thucydides trap, but that Thucydides trap is one of hubris. This is Thucydides' great concern and perhaps the greatest lesson he had to teach. And again, as you emphasize, um, 
It was late in the war, in the third phase of the war, with Athens' foolish embarkation of its campaign to conquer distant Sicily that led to Athens' ruin. And that was for what Thucydides thought was the lesson of the Peloponnesian War, and it was the lesson of avoiding arrogance and hubris. For Thucydides, the tragedy was that Pericles' more cautious, narrow, limited war fighting strategy wasn't pursued, that Athens got very full of itself, and also that years of war made Athenian society disfigured and hardened and made it more susceptible to these types of hubristic adventures. And so this is where the kind of realist association with the concept of prudence uh, comes from, because the true lesson of the Peloponnesian War has to do with the need to avoid um, outrageous uh, hubristic adventures by great powers. So I think that's a really important part of, of what you just introduced there. So one of the things I love about your work is I've seen lectures of yours where you've emphasized the role, the impact, the legacy of the 2003 invasion of Iraq, and subsequently the 2008 financial crisis in explaining much of the social disintegration that's happened in the United States. And you actually have this great comparison of interwar France in the 1930s, the Third Republic, which famously collapsed in six weeks, and then a huge contingent of it conspired or it was um, collaborated with the Nazis um, with contemporary America. So pin in that because it's a conversation I'd like to have. What, um, How does this paradigm that we're describing here and, and uncertainty and humility and national interest, which we really haven't mm -hmm. sort of defined what is the national interest, um, fit into the example of Iraq? And where does Iraq fit in in the, in the history of American empire? Is it a watershed moment? Is it sort of our Sicilian expedition? It is analogous to the Sicilian expedition in that, and I don't say this in hindsight, uh, realists of almost all stripes, classical realists, non-classical realists, structural realists, what have you, and of course many others, thought uh, the Iraq war that the U.S. embarked on in 2003 was going to be a colossal blunder. And this gets back to the point of the no end zone comment from earlier on, not because the analysts didn't think that the U.S. could win the initial battle, but rather it was that politics would continue after that. And so what was the plan after you took care of military business very rapidly and successfully? And most cautious analysts thought that it would lead to disarray in an uncertain world. Uh, the question of hubris, however, comes in largely here. The reason why the U.S., invaded Iraq ultimately was goes back to something you mentioned earlier about unipolarity, this strange permissive condition. The U.S. was the only country in the world that could have even imagined taking on such a war, sending large armed forces halfway around the globe to try and conquer another country. No other state in the system, if they wanted to, would have had the capacity to even do that. Um, but to most of us at the time, it seemed like folly, uh, a very bad idea. And I think not surprisingly that that perspective was vindicated. Um, so I do think you can see analogies between the Sicilian operation and the invasion of Iraq. Similarly, you could tell a story about the Vietnam War in similar terms. The v U.S. could only send 500,000 troops 10,000 miles away from its shores to fight a war of very uncertain purpose, not because its power was limited, but because it had too much power. It, it had a surplus of security and a surplus of capacity, and only countries with such radical surpluses of power and felt feeling very secure at home, there's nobody threatening them, that could embark on such fantastic and distant adventures for, for reasons that do seem to deviate from what you you properly invoked as the, the national interest. What our interest was in the Vietnam War is, is much narrower than many interests that most countries face in international politics on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, I think the Vietnam War and the Iraq War, uh, they, I'm sure they, sh they share many similarities. But one of the similarities that I think is relevant to this discussion is that they both inhinge, they both um, negatively impacted um, the perception of America around the world and also domestically 
impacted people's trust in their governments, um, which is something that it's kind of a fuzzy concept, this this idea of trust or legitimacy, something that we talked about in our conversation recently with Paul Tucker. But it's something I would like to talk about. Before we do, you, t- you said national interest again. Let's actually define that because I think this one is crucial. What is the national interest and how important is it that it is something that people feel that they share? that people are sort of have a consensus around? This is a very important concept. And I think it's something that the realists give, but that the realists can be challenged on. So the national interest is an interest of a political entity, nations, we call them states, whatever, um, that is not reducible to the interests of individuals collectively. It is a shared interest. And we can think of those interests as having three layers. One is simply national integrity, that is protection against foreign invaders. So that we see it's in the interest of all states, we assume as international relations scholars, that they do not want to be invaded and conquered and dominated by outsiders. And that's not really reducible to narrow individual interests, but it is an interest collectively shared by all members of society. And then beyond that rather simple uh, definition of the national interest, we also see a shared interest in wanting to retain national policy autonomy. We want to be left alone uh, to, to do what we want in our within our own borders as we see fit and not have those orders imposed upon us by outsiders. And then finally, there's a third uh, layer, what the, the scholar Arnold Wolfers called milieu goals, which is foreign policy of a state is directed not toward perhaps a narrow purpose, but rather towards trying to shape the world in a way that makes it conducive to national values, that this is the sort of world I'm comfortable living in. I feel safer here. I feel more comfortable here. And obviously, only great powers really have the luxury of having foreign policies that can pursue such broader concerns. Realism relies on the concept of the national interest, that somehow there are these interests that transcend the collective interests of individuals. But That concept, which is central to realism and to much of IR theory, can nevertheless be challenged and unpacked because what I just said, aside from not wanting to be invaded and enjoying some domestic policy autonomy, uh, can be defined in a number of different directions. And therefore, the national interest, even as this collectivity, can be contested and it can also bend in another a number of possible directions. So what a state's foreign policy disposition is will be defined by its understanding, its interpretation of its national interest. But history shows us that the national interest of states can, in fact, be defined in a number of plausible ways. And so that starts to unpack this very tidy concept of the national interest that can get a little messy. And I think it is an area in which realist scholars can be criticized because the more negotiable, the more uncertain, the more the national interest can bend in one direction or another, then the less you know, powerful it becomes as a tool for understanding state behavior. So on the one hand, it's central, the concept of the national interest to understanding world politics. But on the other hand, we need to be alert to the fact that it does have these analytical wiggles in it that we want to be attentive to. And I would phrase it as the national interest matters, but it can bend in different directions based on lots of things, including various forms of domestic contestation and various forms of you know ideas, beliefs, and ideologies. Okay, so you're kind of touching on the beginning of the answer to the question I'm going to ask, which is who defines the national interest? And then tack onto that, what is America's national interest? So the first question, we can give examples of it. The, the, the classical example of the national interest is British foreign policy for a couple of centuries and their their national interest and and this this one seems pretty straightforward to me was that no single power come to dominate the continent of Europe why because if a single power dominated the continent of Europe then they could actually threaten Britain 
Uh, but if the continent was divided politically and there was a sort of balance of power on the continent, uh, then Britain would be safer. And that's why Britain historically over centuries, tended to ally with the relatively weaker side in a confrontation between two sets of powers on the continent. So that's an easy, that's a, it's almost like a gimme, right? This, if we want to say what's the most easy example of the national interest, it's Britain not wanting one power to dominate the continent of Europe because that would then possibly threaten Britain, and therefore Britain could gear its foreign policy toward trying to prevent that from happening. Quick interjection. Is it easier to define the national interest in a multipolar world? Well, it is. I would I would turn that on its head. It is going to go back to what you said at the very beginning. It is harder to define the national interest in a unipolar world because that unipole is so powerful and is so unthreatened that it has the space to do almost anything it wants. So There are take... no restraints. There are really limited restraints. And so poly in domestic politics can drive all sorts of different agendas that are unconstrained by the immediate need to secure the state from external threats. Exactly. And, and that's what made the unipolar moment so confusing, uh, analytically, that is. So we had the bipolar Cold War confrontation. And there we could define the national interest pretty easily, which is we don't want to lose the Cold War. Well, what does that mean? It means that we recognize the Soviet Union as a very powerful adversary. And so we're generally, with differences across seven or eight presidencies, orienting our policies towards managing our international relations in a way that limited the threat that might emerge from the Soviet Union coming to dominate a large part of the globe because that might threaten us. But when the Cold War ends and the Soviet Union disappears and you look out the window and you say, well, if if my point of departure for the national interest is I want to make sure I'm safe, uh, in the unipolar moment, you know, the U.S. in historical perspective was extraordinarily safe. And so there wasn't an obvious definition of the national interest. I mean, the Cold War was easy on the national interest. And that's why, you know, presidents from different political parties and different political ideologies, they may have orchestrated America's Cold War policy differently, but they didn't change the basic orientation of we're living in a bipolar world and minding the national interest store means being attentive to this Cold War competition between an adversary that we can easily recognize as the one that is potentially dangerous to us. You know, I feel very fortunate to have lived kind of on, on to, to have grown up on one side of this of the how do I describe this? Having grown up on one side of a series of of kind of flips, not just in geopolitics, but also technologically, something we spoke about recently with Chuck Klosterman on 1990s culture and this divide between the pre-mobile internet and the post-mobile internet. Um and similarly, having grown up in the period of unipolarity. I remember, and I went to college in the early 2000s, so I had a professor who was a realist who I learned foreign policy from in 2002. He laid out exactly why the Iraq war was going to be disaster. One of the most compelling reasons at the time, as I recall, was the, the, um, the fact that Iraq was not a coherent nation state the way that the U.S. is or the way that France is, that you had these three very different mm -hmm. uh, identities and the Shiites, the Sunnis, and the Kurds. Um, and then I also had another professor of political economy in 2003 during the Iraq war. And he started the class, the very first lecture. And he said, it was sort of tongue in cheek, but he said that he regretted the end of the Cold War because at least with the Cold War, we knew who they were. We knew who we were. We had a story, we had a unifying story and a common identity. And at the time, I didn't really appreciate the significance of that statement. Because I feel like and this is this is a, this is this is getting to a question. I feel like the 1990s was us sort of groping in the dark, trying to find a common narrative that would be compelling enough to inspire the American public to get on board with a particular agenda for the Washington consensus. And ultimately, we kind of failed in that. And I think the 2003 invasion of Iraq was the beginning of the unraveling of American empire. Uh, 
my question is, do you agree with that framing? I mean, what? how would you characterize what the 1990s was about? And do you feel that, to, to the point about you know uncertainty, I don't want to go too much over my skis here and talk about inevitability, but was it kind of inevitable that it, the U.S. would be unable to maintain this kind of global hegemony? So two questions. Do you agree with the framing that the 1990s was a sort of groping out in the dark? And two, was it inevitable that this would happen one way or the other, whether it was Iraq or whether it was something else? So I want to answer your second question first because it's the easier one, which is I prefer the phrasing not surprising, right? Classical realists don't do inevitable, but we do do surprise, right? We, we, we always focus on, well, what might be likely to happen and why should we not be surprised? And that is part of the kind of realist prudence. We want to think about not what is necessarily going to happen, but the plausible paths that can lead to danger. So I would phrase it as it is not at all surprising that the U.S. ran into the difficulties it did at the end of the Cold War. But to go back to your larger, more complex question, yes, it, yes, that is exactly right. I don't want to... Um, have an ode to the Cold War. The Cold War had lots and lots of terrible things associated with it. And the the US, our government, did lots of things in the name of fighting the Cold War that were horrifying. Uh, and and I, I use that word purposefully. And there were lots of uh, people in the world who suffered due to the Cold War. And we also have to remember, you know, the tyrannical regimes in the East that because of the bipolar order, no country was going to try and stop that tyranny from staying in place. So the bipolar order was blissful analytically uh, because we knew exactly how the world worked and there were certain routines about it. And in that sense, it was sort of predictable. Um, and it was also productive for the U.S. in ways that you described in that it created within the country a very broad foreign policy coalition. Lots of disparate actors for a variety of reasons all shared the view that the Cold War in one form or another was more or less worth fighting and that this is what we were doing as a world power. And after the Cold War, by 1992, you see a lot of confusion in the United States about, well, what exactly are we uh, supposed to be doing in the world? I remember attending a seminar uh a talk by the legendary scholar Samuel Huntington. He has a mixed reputation now, but he was a rather eminent scholar. And he really gave a talk in which he admitted that he was sort of confused about where the United States' interests lay immediately after the Cold War. He was kind of looking around the world and saying, well, what is the purpose of American power? What are we supposed to be doing? And and what what that, what he was reflecting in that moment, he came up with his own ideas later, uh, was that, that, that broad, tight, domestic Cold War coalition unravels. I mean, in the 1992 election, you have two things going on. You have the election of a, a young president with no foreign policy experience, uh, and that might have been a bigger deal uh, during the Cold War. But you also see the beginning of insurgent isolationist candidates, Pat Buchanan, Ross Perot. These things come to full flower, of course, uh, in the 21st century. But the origins of isolationism, neo-isolationism, nativist nationalism either, these can be traced to the end of the Cold War, 1992, uh, with the confusion of, okay, Cold War over, how do we now define, articulate, and pursue the American national interest? And there is when that national interest becomes contested across a variety of different actors, ideologies, interests, and perspectives, and that is indeed a bit messier we do see within a few short years, I argue by 1994, 1995, the Clinton administration finally coming around to articulating what the new American national interest is, and that is the encouragement of economic globalization, and in particular, financial globalization. Uh, I think that that project was purposeful. And as I have written on many occasions, I think that project was also misguided and ultimately catastrophic uh, for U.S. interests. But that was that was the new, essentially, quote unquote, grand strategy that the U.S. thought it was in its interest to promote a world of unfettered globalization. 
Man, so much to to unpack here. Um, I couldn't agree more. And I want to highlight a couple episodes that we did touching on this topic, specifically uh, on the the emerging class wars that came out of that. I mean, in, in many ways, you could actually go back to maybe the 1970s and begin the process. But the 1990s um, was a crucial period of time. You had a huge debate around NAFTA. And what the Clinton administration at the time proposed was that Okay, let us let us do this because it's Pareto optimal and, mm-hmm. you know, Ricardian um, economics tells us we should do it. And we want to have the Chinese focus on what they're good at. And we'll focus on what we're good at. We'll grow the overall pie. Everyone gets better off. You know, rising tide lifts all boats. But we'll offset that with, you know, worker programs, you know, distributional programs, et cetera. But actually what ended up happening was that we experienced over time a radical redistribution in not only wealth in American society, accelerated by the 2008 financial crisis, and we'll get into that in the second hour, but also of power. And this is something that's very important that Michael Lind, who had been on the show, who wrote a book called Class Wars, talks about. We also did an episode with Julius Krein on this that I I think is very important. And some of these themes came up in an episode that we did with Alex um, I'm forgetting her last name again, but uh, she wrote a documentary about she did a documentary on Alex Jones and Alex Jones works with a lot of these themes from the early 1990s, Waco, you know, Timothy McVeigh, et cetera. Um, you mentioned Sam Huntington. Of course, he'd written Clash of Civilizations. He kind of went through this period of time in the in the 2000s, the last 20 years where his ideas kind of lost a lot of influence because the world didn't look like that Interestingly enough, it seems to be looking more like that today. I kind of threw out the outline that I had for this discussion. Um, And so I think what would make more sense in the second hour, Jonathan, is to focus on some of the the most important uh, case studies and then and then also kind of where where and apply this methodology to kind of what the world looks like today. I mentioned the Russia-Ukraine war. I want to get into that specifically, and I want to understand what you think about that war, the not just the prudence of the of the invasion on the part of Putin, what maybe his objectives were, but also the prudence of our own countermeasures, and what the what um, what our role you think should be a normative conversation about um, what our role should be in Europe, and you know, and then that can also feed into a conversation about a China pivot. I also want to explore this. Um, analog of interwar France, because it speaks to to one of my biggest concerns that I've tried to illuminate for years on the show, which is the culture wars in America and what is happening to us domestically. How is it that we're tearing each other apart? And is this something that, because I think for a lot of people, it's they they seem to in their daily lives approach the world as though we still live in this paradigm of unipolarity, where something bad happens in the world and it's our fault. It's our warmongering. It's the industri- military industrial complex. I know what it is. It's, you know, I read my Howard Zinn and we're at fault for everything. But I think actually that the world looks very different today. And these internal divisions um, and clashes that happen are, you know, do, do not happen without a cost. I also want to explore the example of um, British appeasement of Nazi Germany, because I think it's an interesting way to think about America's relationship to China. Because um, appeasement is also accommodation, you know, and too much accommodation becomes appeasement, Uh, not enough appeasement, too much appeasement or less appeasement becomes accommodation. Mm -hmm. And so I'm very curious to know what your thoughts are about how to approach this relationship, because we obviously do not want to have war with China, but we also don't want to get into a situation like we got into and not to compare the Chinese Communist Party to to Nazi Germany, but we don't want to get into a similar situation where we just give up on the things that matter to us and we just basically live in a in a Chinese dominated world if that world means that it impacts um our lives as well. Those are just kind of some <laughs> some things. Um we'll see what we can get into and what we can get into. For anyone who is new to the program, Hidden Forces is listener supported. We don't accept advertisers or commercial sponsors. The entire show is funded from top to bottom by listeners like you. If you want access to the second hour of today's conversation with Jonathan, head over to hiddenforces.io slash subscribe and sign up to one of our three content tiers. 
all subscribers gain access to our premium feed, which you can use to listen to the rest of today's conversation on your mobile device using your favorite podcast app, just like you're listening to this episode right now. Jonathan, stick around. We're going to move the second hour of this conversation onto the premium feed. Looking forward to it.